Good afternoon, dear colleagues that are following us mostly from Middle East and Asia Pacific area. For those who do know me, my name is Nasser Al Asmar, and I am Scientific Advisor and Embryology Director here at iGenomics headquarters in Valencia, Spain. Welcome again to an iGenomics webinar. It is true that we are all six of webinars, and therefore we are only performing now the ones that most of you are requesting. So having a huge menu of webinars almost every day, it is great to tell you that as well as on the previous occasions, we have received many registrations and I found it impressive, not only the number of people registered, but also from how many different countries. As always, we continue working on preparing new content that will be useful for you. So I want to ask you to send us your suggestions for future lectures. For those of you who are not regulars at our scientific sessions, I'd like to remind you that you can see our previous presentations on our website, www.igenomics.es slash webinars, and you can register for future topics that are of your interest. In today's webinar, we will have an exceptional lecturer whom most of you will know. It is a pleasure for me to introduce my colleague and friend, Dr. Antonio Capalbo, Genomics Research Director and Laboratory Director at iGenomics Italy. Of course, I also wanted to tell you that as usual, once today's talk is over, in the next few days, you will receive a certificate of attendance and a brief survey of just three questions where we want you to share your ideas, doubts, and concerns with us. And without further delay on my part, Dr. Capalbo, Antonio, please, whenever you want, the floor is yours. Okay, Th thank you Nasser for the introduction and uh, welcome everybody to this webinar. I trust you can you can see my screen. Yes, Let we can, me... Antonio. Okay, that's great. Let me just move this and I'm ready to go. So in the next um, uh, in the next 30, 40 minutes, I'm going to to walk you through uh, this uh, challenging topic, which is uh, how we can detect mosaicism in embryos, how reliable it is, and uh, what are the uh, predictive, clinical predicting values of this uh, type of uh, designation that we can make during the course of an IVF treatment cycles with pre-implantation genetic testing for uh, aneuploidies. So, um, I always like to start my presentation by reminding uh, the paramount importance about myotically derived aneuploidies for human reproduction and fertility. Uh, we all know very well from decades of investigation in the genetics of pregnancies or in postnatal or prenatal space that aneuploidies are mostly coming and occurring in humans as a consequence of a defective meiotic segregation, which is extremely uh, linked to the uh, female age. And um, recently, uh, a, a large group of investigators that was led by Professor Eva Altman have reported this data on thousands of human eggs that were analyzed across the board of reproductive lifespan on the female from the men to the menopause. And uh, they have actually characterized the aneuploidy rate in thousands of oversight that are, and the euploidy rate is displayed here in this U curve, U um, uh, red curve here. And you can see how this curve is actually shaping the red line uh, on the bottom, which is showing the uh, human fertility over reproductive lifespan, meaning to say that the errors, the chromosomal errors in human eggs are really the ones that models for reproduction that are shaping uh, human fertility over reproductive lifespan. So when we have um, meiotic aneuploidies that are present in a, in a zygote and in, in a developing embryo, all the cells are supposed to be affected by the same chromosomal uh, abnormality. And this is not posing any issues on a diagnostic perspective because wherever we take the biopsy, then we're going to get a good representation of the remaining chromosomal constitution of the embryo. 
And we also know very well that uh, when an embryo is aneuploid because of meiotically uh, derived aneuploidy, then uh, the outcome is very uh, well described and uh, uh, we can provide a very uh, good counseling to patients about the fate of these embryos, that is implantation failure, miscarriage, or uh, in very few situations it can be an aneuploidy which is viable and compatible with life, and uh, this will lead to an aneuploid conception. Now, uh, we uh, often hear in, in some meetings that uh, this type of aneuploidies can get through self-correction during pre-implantation development. Uh, however, this is more a, a myth rather than a fact. We all know very well that uh, self-correction of a meiotically derived aneuploidy is an extremely rare event, and uh, we know that because this event is measurable. We all know well that when uh, a, a trace of me that is inherited uh, meiotically is corrected throughout embryonic development, uh, this will lead to a population of cells that have a uniparental dysomy. And uniparental dysomy at the blastoid stage has been measured uh, in the past on thousands and thousands of uh, human blastoid stage embryos uh, by the group of Nathan Treff and colleagues, showing that this event is extremely rare. 0.06% of human blastocysts have been shown by SNP array uh, to have uh, uniparental dysomy, meaning to say that self correction of meiotically derived aneuploidies is very rare. And one, once an embryo has an aneuploidy disease, this is uh, very uh, uh, associated with a very clear negative outcome in case these embryos are transferred. And we know that also from the clinical, from many different clinical studies, particular from non-selection uh, studies that are, I think, the most powerful design in order to um, estimate and evaluate what is the positive and negative predicting value of a PGTA assay and analysis that we can perform. Particularly in this design, you can see that, that uh, what usually happens is that you take a biopsy, you save this biopsy for uh, uh, <clears throat> later stages, aneuploidy testing, and you transfer the embryos without knowing the aneuploidy status. So after the transfer, the trophectomy biopsy is analyzed usually in a blended way, and you can really uh, evaluate with very few or minimal level of uh, errors what is the positive predicting value or the negative predicting value. The positive predicting value is how many aneuploid embryos are indeed aneuploid and they are not producing a live birth. The negative predicting value in this case is uh, how many euploid embryos will uh, result in a live birth. These are very valuable and important information to evaluate what is the accuracy and the clinical validity of our assays. And uh, as you can see here in this study, out of the 102 embryos diagnosed as uniform aneuploidy, then none of them uh, progressed to a sustained implantation or delivery, while the negative predicting value was very high with 64% of euploid embryos resulting in a life ball. Uh, we know that this topic is very controversial and indeed uh, time to time we also uh, read uh, throughout the literature some discordant findings. For instance, if you, uh, if you have a chance to read this paper by the group of Norbert Glacier, you could see that at the beginning they were complaining and they were questioning the accuracy of aneuploidy testing because they show that some uh, transfer of fully aneuploid embryos resulted in live births. However, um, looking carefully at the data that they have produced in the, the original version of the National Cell Biology paper, we uh, could make an, I mean, uh, argue about how these data were delivered because at the end they were inconsistent with previous uh, publication and presentation um, of this data set and uh, they make an amendment uh, recently showing that uh, indeed out of the 61 fully aneuploid embryos that went transferred, none of them uh, they result in a live birth or in an uh, ongoing pregnancy. Particularly, they also observed that many of them result in uh, miscarriage that had the same abnormality that was previously detected in the, at the pre-implantation uh, stage. 
Now, today we have many of these studies where the outcomes of uniformly unemployed embryos have been evaluated, usually blinded and with a prospective non selection design. We have recently um, collected all this uh, evidence and put it in the same table, in a single table. And as you can see here, the lethality rate of embryos that are designated as fully unemployed in following an uh, at BGTA the plasticity stage uh, with many different uh, technologies and assays for unemployed testing is about 98%, uh, meaning to say that the vast majority of these embryos are not going to make a baby. Uh, most concerning outcome uh, following the transfer of full unemployed embryos is however the miscarriage rate, as you can see here, uh, based on the evidence available today, if you uh, decide to transfer an embryo which is uniform unemployed, you should expect to have 86% of miscarriage rate. So uh, I think that today we have a robust and uh, reproducible evidence about the fact that uniform unemployed embryos are uh, very well designated as normal and shouldn't be considered for clinical use. Now, on the top of a euploid and aneuploid embryos, we, all, we also have uh, an intermediate categor category, an hybrid category, which is the so-called mosaic um, abnormality. In this case, the aneuploidy uh, originate during the mitotic division of the embryo and uh, will generate an, a, a, a developing embryos which is made up of a population of normal and abnormal cells, which is of course causing some uh, issues and posing some challenges for that diagnostic perspective because uh, by definition uh, it will be very difficult to make an accurate evaluation of the mosaicism rate by analyzing only a portion of the whole embryo. Now, to make a little bit of clarity around the terminology and also to uh, buckle some uh, myths and misconceptions on this topic, let's start first from the definition. So, mosaicism refers to the presence of genetically distinct cells within an organism, in our case an embryo, that result from post-degotic maturation event. We may have two different types of uh, mosaicism. One is the genetic mosaicism, where we have that the variation happen at the DNA sequence level, such as single nucleotide variants or indels, or we may have a set of genetic mosaicism where the variation and the, <coughs> the abnormality uh, is at the chromosomal level. So, and then further than that, the set of genetic mosaicism is the one that we usually uh, discuss and we have been discussing over the last years in PGT can be further. Uh, distinguish and uh, uh, break down in the aneuploid mosaicism where we have uh, distinct aneuploid complements due to a metodic error that happen in an embryo that is already affected with a meiotic aneuploidy. So at the end, this is not a big issue because all the cells of this embryo will be abnormal. But the one uh, type of mosaicism which is concerning us most is the diploid aneuploid mosaicism where we have a combination of normal and abnormal cells. So, um, further than that, we have um, also some uh, misconception around uh, mosaicism when we hear that um, since we are all mosaic in adult stage, all uh, human embryos, human preimplantation embryos should at the same level be in mosaic, but this is uh, a very weak assumption or uh, I mean, it's, it's mostly speculation because we all know well that uh, in our adult life we accumulate um, mutation. So uh, it, it, it makes sense that, that, that we are almost like at other stage, but it doesn't mean that also all the embryos should be uh, mosaic at the chromosomal level. Um, it, it may be the opposite can be true because, I mean, mosaicism is linearly correlated with a number of mitotic divisions that happen within the body. And uh, uh, I mean, to be fair, uh, once we reach the blaster stage, a few hundreds of mitosis happened. Uh, at this stage and that are uh, significantly lower as compared to the postnatal stage, for instance, or the post-implantation stage where millions or billions of mitosis happen in our, in our cells. So if we, if we wanted to see that mosaicism is really linearly correlated with the number of mitosis that happen from the, from the conception uh, time point, then uh, probably uh, the pre-implantation stage is at least uh, subject to uh, mosaicism as compared to later uh, stages of our life cycle. 
Uh, another important point uh, to make clear uh, before we go through uh, mosaicism in PGTA is uh, the incidence of mosaicism in human pregnancies, which is being estimated in, in hundreds of uh, publications and works in the past. And we all know well that mosaicism uh, uh, is affecting about 0.3%, 0.4% of all pregnancies. And in particular, we also know very well that IVF is not a risk factor for mosaicism. There have been several studies that have compared the incidence of mosaicism in IVF and spontaneous pregnancies, showing that they happen at similar rates, meaning to say that infertility by itself or the all IVF procedure that we uh, perform in our IVF treatments are not increasing the risk for mosaicism in pregnancies. And as a consequence, we are not under a big pressure of increasing our diagnostic capability towards mosaicism detection in PGTA treatment cycles. Now, let's have a look at how mosaicism is uh, detected uh, in PGTA uh, cycles when we analyze trophector and biopsy samples. Usually what uh, we commonly do based on, on uh, standard NGS sequencing analysis and protocols for PGTA is to uh, report mosaicism when we see intermediate chromosome copy number that are those values of copy numbers following uh, between the normal and the trisomic uh, or monosomic range. So when we see this pattern that is displayed in, in the slide, uh, we usually refer it as intermediate copy number, and this is uh, what is used as evidence uh, to report that that biopsy is a uh, mosaic for a given chromosome. Now, this, this is uh, extremely different from what is done, for instance, in uh, prenatal diagnosis when we have um, when we do CBS or uh, amniocentesis and we can visualize different cell population by looking at metaphase spreads and when we can really uh, see that there is a population of cells that are uh, normal uh, in a sample that is uh, also made up of normal cells. In this case, we use this, this algorithm and intermediate copy number to call mosaicism and this is subject to many different uh, assumptions and weaknesses. For instance, we know that very well that intermediate copy number can also arise as a consequence of technical variability or experimental noise, and this may <clears throat> come as a consequence of the fact that working on a clinical uh, setting, we may have biopsies that have a different quality, that different cellularities, and this is of course something that may introduce some technical variation and generate some artifactual intermediate copy number. Another uh, weakness of this approach is that usually the thresholds that are used for calling mosaicism are those that are developed on cell lines uh, mixer models where mosaicism is mimicked by mixing up normal and normal cells in different proportions and by uh, deriving the thresholds and sensitivity and specificity versus some specific, specific thresholds for mosaicism classification. Of course, I don't have to tell you that working on cell lines is completely different as working uh, that the standard clinical activity we perform on clinical biopsies because cell lines are, of course, uh, a more reproducible and standardized study model as compared to what happened and to the experimental variability that we are exposed to in a clinical setting. Now, this consideration, this technical consideration, clearly explain the reason why some clinics uh, over the last years have been reporting some uh, very low rates of human embryos being mosaic at the blast stage, two to three, four percent, while other clinics have been reporting 40 percent, even up to 30, 40 percent of human embryos being mosaic. Of course, I don't have to explain to you that it's not the biology which is changing from one clinic to another, but it's more a matter of uh, how you can control the experimental variability and uh, how you are um, capable of lowering the overcalling of this type of abnormalities coming from experimental variability, and uh, this is of almost all there. So a second assumption that is very weak um, for, for reporting mosaicism in pre-implantation human embryos is the sampling bias. 
as you can see here, I think it's very clear that by definition, if an embryo is a true mosaic embryo, then depending on where we take the biopsy, we may get completely different outcomes. And uh, this is something that, of course, uh, always need to be a knowledge when performing any type of diagnosis that we are I mean, limiting our observation to a sample uh, that is may also not be representing the, the, the remaining uh, chromosomal constitution of the embryo in both ways. It may be that we take only Euplant cells while the embryo is mosaic, is a true mosaic, or it can happen that we take uh, all the unemployed cells while the embryo is a true mosaic. But even if we sample the uh, cells, a trophetary biopsy, which is a mixture of normal and normal cells, the rate of mosaicism that we can identify in this biopsy can be completely different to what that is in the end. Now, uh, an important point is that, uh, is that trying to, to lower the overcalling of mosaicism, because when, when we report mosaicism in the clinical setting, uh, this comes with uh, very relevant uh, consequences for, for the couples uh, undergoing the IVF. First of all, we need to acknowledge that when we report the diagnosis of mosaicism, the couple will have to undergo an additional session of genetic counseling and they will have to evaluate the embryo transfer of these mosaic embryos uh, in a context of increased anxiety, uh, distress, and, uh, uh, and of course, this is not something that, 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 that should be, I mean, uh, uh, generated by, by, by uncertainty and by the uncertainty of several types or some types of diagnosis. Then the second uh, consequence that the couple will face when transferring an aneuploid embryo and mosaic embryos is the increase of the indication that has been generated uh, to go through an amniocentesis procedure, an invasive procedure that comes with some very well known risk of iatrogenic uh, um, abortion. And uh, that should be, of course, justified by some evidence, some clinical evidence about the positive predicting value of this type of mosaic diagnosis. But I think that the worst outcome of mosaicis reporting is the fact that most of the patients in the past have been discarding these embryos. If we look, for instance, at the publication of Moon and colleagues in 2017, you can see that less than 3% of the almost 5,000 and those that were designated as mosaic, then they were transferred back to patients, which is uh, highlighting a very concerning practice and a very alarming uh, risk of wastage of embryos that are otherwise uh, healthy and uh, capable of a normal uh, implantation and development to tell. So what is this practice based on? This practice of uh, designating embryo as most sites in, in, in the uh, broad spectrum of 20 to 80 percent of variation was supported only on retrospective evidence about a slightly lower live birth rate outcomes following the transfer of uh, these low um, mosaic embryos or high mosaic embryos. There is the largest studies published by Manuel Biotti and uh, uh, some other uh, colleagues that look at these outcomes uh, retrospectively, they found out that the low mosaic category had just a slightly lower library potential, while the high grade mosaics they were indeed associated with a significantly uh, lower uh, library rate. Now, there is a very important bias uh, when looking at this data retrospectively. And the big bias is the one of population selection, uh, because in the standard clinical workflow, uh, when reporting mosaicism, embryos that are designated as mosaic, they are left behind. They are transferred usually as last option after the transfer of the euploid embryo that goes first. So the situation here is pretty much clear that when the, you, you, you downgrade and and they prioritize embryos that are mosaic, you get all the good prognosis patients getting pregnant with euploid embryo transfer, with the first, the second, or the third euploid embryo transfer, while the, the patients that fail with previous euploid embryo transfer are the ones that are receiving uh, the mosaic embryos, and the ones where we are going to measure what is the clinical gain of a mosaic embryo transfer. So in this case, we are 
uh, it is very clear that when we look at this data respectively, we are measuring the reproductive potential of mosaic embryos on a very poor prognosis population of patients that have been selected because they failed with one or multiple duploid, previous duploid embryo transfer. So what we did in our study was to uh, try to avoid this kind of selection bias and to do so we have designed a prospective non-selection trial back in 2017 where all the uh, putative mosaic embryos between 20 to 50 percent of intermediate copy number were reported back as euploid. Uh, this has helped to avoid the selection bias because the embryos for transfer were chosen irrespectively to the genetic outcome. So uh, the, both the physician and the patients were blinded to the outcome of the mosaicism in the 20 to 50 percent of variation because these embryos were indeed reported as euploid in the same way as for the fully euploid embryo that did not show any intermediate copy number. So uh, after this, um, during the course of this trial, after the transfer, uh, we were able to unmask and unblind the results of the genetic testing and uh, we could generate three different study group and arms here, the uniform euploid embryos, the low mosaic between the 20 to 30 percent of variation or the moderate mosaic category between the 30 to 50 percent of variation and we could analyze um, the clinical outcomes as well as do some uh, postnatal uh, follow-up on some of these cases that uh, resulted in a live birth. So just to make 100% sure and clear to you, uh, embryos in the low grade mosaic or in the medium grade mosaic uh, were, were all reported back to patients as euploid in order to avoid any population selection bias. Um, the first step in our study and uh, how we set out the thresholds for reporting these embryos as normal this was based on a rib biopsy analysis of 73 different uh, blastocysts that were donated for research and were disaggregated down to five different uh, portions, four trophetoderm samples and uh, the ICM. So in this rib biopsy study, multifocal analysis, we could uh, observe, for instance, what was the positive predicting value of a low mosaic um, versus the ICM or the remaining embryos. Here we have an example where a low mosaic in a clinical trophatal biopsy was not confirmed in subsequent biopsies, or you have here another example where a uniform aneuploidy for chromosome 21 was indeed confirmed in, across all the biopsy of the same embryo. In this way, we were able to evaluate what is the positive predicting value and what were also the risks of uh, having these low or medium mosaic embryos being classified as euploid. Now, this is a uh, kind of complex uh, data to, to show in a, in a slide, but I will try to walk you through this table, which at the end, uh, you can read it very well. Um, so how this table works? This table works with a reference trophetoderm outcome on the left side and uh, with, with a confirmation rate on the, the subsequent biopsies that were taken uh, in that embryo. Uh, in the case where you have a normal ICM on the left side and a normal ICM on the right side, and also according to the other trophetoderm outcomes of other trophetoderm biopsies. So just to give you a very simple example, when the reference trophetoderm outcome, the reference trophetoderm biopsy was fully unemployed, uh, we could see that 98% uh, of the embryos and indeed all biopsies, all the remaining biopsies, uh, fully unemployed as the original ones, including the inner cell mass, while in 2% uh, uh, of cases that biopsies was uh, present only on the reference trophetoderm outcome. So it was most likely a, a very confined mosaicism case. If we go to the high mosaic category, which is 50 to 70 percent of intermediate copy number, you can see that this is really the grade zone of our uh, diagnostic uh, pipeline and assay because here you have that 65 percent of the iMosai classification does now to be fully unemployed while the remaining 35 percent are indeed uh, some uh, sort of uh, true mosaic embryos and true mosaic pattern. 
Uh, however, it's important to know that the IMOSI category, at least in our diagnostic pipeline, they account for 1.6% of all embryos and diagnoses that we make at the plus stage. So if, even if we I mean, have some level of uncertainty here in this category, is not going to impact the clinical outcomes in a significant way. And most importantly, uh, usually we, we discourage and we do not recommend the transfer of these embryos, as in the vast majority of cases, they are indeed fully unemployed. So if we look then back to the euploid low mosaic and medium mosaic, you can now appreciate that all the, 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 these uh, patterns, they show a similar confirmation rate throughout uh, the embryo meaning to say they had the similar, similar risk of being uh, unemployed. And uh, therefore, we consider that these, these embryos could be treated as a single category of euploidy. Now, here you have the, the table uh, with the demographic and cycle data of the enrolled patients. Uh, we could enroll, we could enroll 783 patients, 824 uh, stimulation cycles, the mean female age is consistent with advanced maternal age population as well as all other uh, demographic and cycle uh, data. The annual rate was uh, the annual rate, rate was 41%, including the fully unemployed and high mosaic embryos. In this in this study, five different centers in Italy uh, were involved and uh, and uh, performed all the recruitment and uh, clinical procedures, namely in particular Genera, Humanitas, and uh, the Metra. That of course we want to really acknowledge and thank for uh, the contribution in the study. Here you have the, the clinical outcomes. Uh, the, the 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 ones that that really matters, um, and you can see. Can immediately see that, that the outcomes of the three study groups were similar in terms of positive pregnancy test, biochemical pregnancy loss, miscarriage rate, and live birth rate. You, you, you really cannot see any, any different. We couldn't see any different. We reach our plan sample size. We perform a multivariate logistic regression analysis in order to control for confounding factors, uh, even uh, by a multivariate analysis, we did not see any association between the PGTA category, whether it was euploid, low mosaic, or, high, or medium mosaic to the uh, clinical outcomes. Also, neonatal outcomes and uh, obstetrical outcomes were similar between the three groups. We've been trying to, uh, to, to, to develop other uh, definitions of mosaicism, to take new parameters, to, 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 to try to link any kind of form of mosaicism to clinical outcomes like the mean mosaicism rate, the mean number of chromosomes that were in mosaic, the incidence of the so-called complex mosaic, more than three or more than five chromosomes being involved in an intermediate copy number, but we fail uh, to detect any statistically significant association with the principal clinical outcomes that we were investigating. Here we have a, a representation, a figure showing all the um, Mm, mosaic chromosomes that were transferred <coughs> during the course of our trial, whether they were classified as low or medium mosaic. And uh, as you can see, since the study <coughs> was very well controlled and uh, blinded, we had also the transfer of embryos with mosaic trisomies for chromosome 21, 18, uh, 13, or uh, other. Uh, more risky chromosomes, but we never got any uh, issues uh, related to that so far. So, uh, as a last analysis in our study, we also perform um, some level of prenatal follow-up. Uh, in particular, in our clinical practice, we do not recommend invasive PGT for all cases and all women uh, conceiving by euploid embryo transfer <clears throat> because we still don't have any evidence that uh, the, the risk of unemployed is, is higher than the invasiveness of the procedure. So we could observe and follow up only in those cases that decided uh, to go through amniocentesis uh, after the transfer of euploid or to the mosaic embryos in our trial. 
And as you can see here, the ones that we <clears throat> had a follow-up, cytogenetic follow-up during the prenatal diagnosis, the only case of confined placental mosaicism was detected for following the transfer of fully euclid embryo that was a confined placental mosaicism with 20% of abnormal cells with a trisomy for the chromosome 22 that was then shown to be normal at the amniocentesis. However, we could um, collect some uh, saliva samples from uh, newborns uh, that were um, obtained following uh, the mosaic embryo transfer. In particular, in this phase of our study, we could collect saliva samples and DNA from the parents uh, in order to investigate if uh, these babies that were born following the mosaic embryo transfer had any evidence or instance of mosaicism or UPD uh, at least as, as investigated through uh, saliva samples. And uh, to do that, we run a high density sniffer ray. We use some um, uh, bioinformatic, well established and bioinformatic algorithm to check for mosaicism and UPD uh, in these newborns, but we fail uh, in this small data set to, uh, to detect any evidence of mosaicism or UPD following the transfer of mosaic. Uh, embryos or putative mosaic embryos. And finally, what I wanted to show you is this modeling that we did in the course of our trial, assuming the situation where low mosaic or low and moderate mosaic embryos would not have been transferred. So, the case where we exclude all the pregnancies and the live births coming from the transfer of mosaic embryos. As a result, if we make, if we make this modeling, uh, we could observe that over one third of babies would not have been born if these mosaic cameras were not transferred in this trial, which made the case for a significant loss in terms of cumulative life death rate that you can get if you uh, do not uh, transfer or consider for transfer these embryos. <clears throat> so, th these evidence are uh, confirmed and uh, corroborated by independent studies and findings. For instance, in this study, Mina Popovich and colleagues, they find out that when growing embryos up to day 12 uh, and comparing the outcomes of a trophetonal biopsy and this embryonic outgrowth on day 12, they could get a 100% concordance rate for both the uniform euploid and aniploid embryos, while the positive predictive value of a mosaicis consistent finding in trophetonal biopsies was extremely low. And also, uh, we have seen in, uh, in animal models and modeling of mosaic embryo transfer, this is not actually uh, representing what happens in, in, in mosaicis because these were chimera embryos. Uh, but in this case, uh, for instance, Helen Bolton and colleagues, they observed that uh, abnormal cells following the transfer of chimeric embryos, they get lost uh, in the post-implantation stage and they can make normal babies, as well as in a more recent uh, nature paper by Urens and colleagues, they show the existence of early developmental bottlenecks in human placenta that are able uh, to normalize post mosaic anecdotes in human embryos. We actually don't know whether all the live birds that we obtained, they were uh, a, a kind of false positive diagnosis of mosaicism because of technical variability and, or experimental noise, uh, or whether uh, they were true mosaicism that is extremely confined to a small region of the placenta or the trophytodermy. And then, I mean, they, they, they get lost in the early post implantation stages, but both explanations are valid and uh, are, are worth to be further explored in, in future studies. What I want also to show you is that uh, what are the risks of transferring uh, mosaic embryos or apparently mosaic embryos following PGTA? Um, they are extremely low, low because you can see here in this table that Nathan Treff has uh, developed and pulled out um, data from many different studies, you can see that uh, today we have only one case where the same mosaicism was, the mosaicism was 
detected in the PGTA stage and confirmed later prenatal uh, diagnosis stage. Uh, this baby didn't show also a phenotype associated with hemocysis and therefore up to today uh, we for sure do not observe any kind of increased risk in mosaicism following the transfer of embryos that are designated as mosaic uh, at the embryo, the pre-implantation embryo uh, level. For sure, uh, there will come new cases where we observe mosaicisms following the transfer of mosaic embryos because this practice is increasing, PGTA, the adoption of PGTA is increasing, so we will have uh, the follow-up on these embryos is, is higher. Uh, and is more detailed as compared to the transfer of uniformly euclid embryos, but important point for the future would be to compare what would be in a very systematic and uh, standardized way, what would be what is really then, if there is any additional risk for having a mosaic pregnancy following the transfer of an embryo that was uh, designated as mosaic and because it shows uh, an intermediate copy number value. So at present, I think we have a uh, vast majority of the evidence uh, suggests that there is not increased risk uh, as compared to the transfer of fully euclid embryos. Because indeed, um, what we have also seen in other studies, for instance, in this study by Fendal, Monet, again, uh, Grifo and colleagues, is that you can also find many cases of mosaicism following the transfer of fully euclid embryos. Um, in this study, although based on a very small sample size, they had 57% of product of conception showing mosaic abnormality following the transfer of fully euploid, uniformly uniploid embryos also uh, using high resolution next generation sequencing. So the point is that uh, always important to cancer patients about the fact that uh, uh, when you uh, even if you're transferring a uniformly euclid embryos, uh, you should also expect some minimal uh, risk of having uh, mosaic pregnancies as for uh, the general population. Uh, the very last point uh, my presentation is about also this practice that has been uh, generated uh, with the introduction of mosaicism reporting in PGTA cycle that is uh, the prioritization of euclid embryos over the mosaic, regardless of any other embryological parameter, that is, you know, morphology, uh, day of development, and other morphological features that have been very well established and are associated with clinical outcomes from uh, decades. So there were uh, at the beginning a couple of <clears throat> Uh, scientific societies, the PGDIS and the cogent, were recommended to transfer euclid embryos first, regardless of morphology. And um, I think, and I'm pretty much sure that there is no study or no evidence today to support uh, this recommendation in the way that uh, I don't, I'm, I, I'm pretty much sure that there is no data uh, telling us that uh, transferring a bad quality euclid embryos is a better option for patients than transferring a 20% mosaic cameras of good quality. So this is something that has been indeed uh, corrected in more recent uh, guidelines and uh, it is something for sure uh, where we, we need to take into consideration different factors, but in particular morphology that we know that has been uh, associated for, for a long time in embryology to, to clinical outcomes. So in conclusion, intermediate copy numbers, the ones at least below 50%, in clinical trophetonary biopsies are uh, either technical variations of um, um, the methodologies and technologies of working on single cells or equivalent type of samples, or they may be true mosaicism that is confined to a small trophetonary portion without ICM involvement and implication for the pregnancy. As a consequence, uh, we believe that reporting mosaicism in this low to moderate range has no elements today of clinical utility, while it can result in a significant wastage of viable and otherwise healthy embryos in case uh, the patients perceive these embryos as chromosomally abnormal and they will discard them for, uh, for, for clinical use. I think it is extremely important as the, in this study to properly validate uh, by non-selection trials and randomized trials uh, the PGTA assays uh, because this can really give us the, 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 the true uh, predicting value, clinical validity and utility that this 
technologies can 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 bring us and can bring to our to our patient. So, and and uh, finally, I want to acknowledge all, all the colleagues that have contributed to this uh, non-selection trial. It was a big effort. It took four years. But at least we are very uh, very much confident uh, that this will help the clinical practice of PGT uh, today and in, 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 in the near in the near future for the benefit of patients. So that's all on my side. I thank you all very much for uh, following the webinar and of course I'm available for any questions that you may have. So please do not hesitate to address questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Antonio. Brilliant as always. And as Antonio said, I would like to invite all of you to make your questions now. Uh, don't be shy. I won't say the names, uh, by the way. But uh, Antonio, I feel like uh, every time that I, I can see you uh, lecturing, uh, even though uh, same topic, three, four weeks of differences, I feel more with more power, with more knowledge. So uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much about that. And uh, well, there are some people asking if they can ask the questions in the question box. And, and the answer is yes, please uh, go ahead. Um, let's start with the, with the first one, Antonio. We have uh, around 10 minutes in order to, uh, to make this uh, Q&A session. Um, we were afraid to transfer mosaic embryos. So question is, should, should we be afraid right now after the data that you showed us? I guess it's about proper genetic counseling. Well, I think that, that, that first of all, you should, you should uh, get to know uh, the validation data that your genetic laboratory um, you should ask your genetic provider to, to show what are the, 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 the validation data about the use of intermediate copy number to, to designate mosaicism, what type of experiment they have done, and what type of validation uh, data they are available in order for you to make the best uh, consideration for your patients. Um, I understand and I appreciate that not all um, providers have developed non-selection studies, so you may have an work around that by, by looking at pre-biopsies data or even cell lines, even though this is not the, 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 ideal, the ideal design and setting. Uh, but still, you should be aware about that and uh, you, should, uh, you should consider that most, uh, there, is, there, is, there is quite a large experience that most of the um, most ICs below the 50% uh, can be, I think, from most providers can be safely considered as, as normal and uh, as for transfer, yes, and can be considered for, for, for embryo transfer without them many concerns. Thank you, Antonio. Um, there's another one that says, in your opinion, should we treat the mosaicism different depending on the chromosome? How about differences between low and high mosaics? Yeah, low mosaic, uh, they, they, most, most of these this low mosaic embryos, they, they can be uh, completely normal embryos just by technical variations. So it's, 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 it's really, I mean, you can you can safely consider them as as as, as normal, of course, and and as I said before, I mean, ask data about validation. I mosaic, um, uh, we 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 getting to know, and we we seeing that most of these I mosaic um, copy number values, they are they can come as a, as a technical variation from the full aneuploid spectrum. So I won't recommend to transfer these embryos. And uh, because, I mean, that, that there is very high risk that you are then uh, transferring fully employed embryos. So everything should be, I think, should be uh, properly validated. We should take this decision based on, 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 on validation data, clinical and, 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 and experimental data. Uh, for instance, now we know that, that up to 50% of variation, there's no big issue in transferring these embryos because we have evidence from, from a non-selection trial and from uh, hundreds and hundreds of embryos that have been disaggregated and uh, investigated. Uh, and I think that in order to make this decision, you, you should have uh, similar, similar evidence from your provider in order to, to make the best decision for, for your patients. 
So now we know that we can safely transfer the low to medium mosaic embryos and that the vast majority of the high mosaic signals are indeed coming from uniform aneuploid embryos. And we can make a uh, best decision for, for uh, improving clinical utility of, of, of the patient. The point that I expect in the future is that, um, that once we want to, to develop new algorithms, we, we, we want to introduce new diagnostic criteria in PGTA, we first perform uh, this kind of studies before introducing uh, big changes that are not validated and are not supported by evidence into the clinical practice. And years later, we realized that probably this was not the, the best way forward. So I'm just, uh, I'm just hoping that for the future, new developments will be uh, better validated before being used and applied to patients. Thank you very much, Antonio, because there is a lot of questions regarding same the, about the high mosaics and also specific chromosomes, you know, such as 13, 18 and 21. Uh, what should we do if we, we should transfer right now? We should wait until further studies, non-selection studies, because well, we will talk later also that we're asking about this bias of another studies that because you transfer first euploids. Um, but yeah, uh, regarding, uh, let me, um, well, you told us at the very beginning of the lectures, but also there is uh, a lot of people asking about, uh, again, self-correction in embryos. So I guess that it is worthy that if you can elaborate a little bit like you explained us at the very beginning of the talk what do you think about this self uh, correction apparently yeah. that a me right yeah sure i mean self correction is something that is uh, very well known in in, in genetics from uh, decades and uh, is is something that that indeed is an, uh, may happen and uh, in particular, but, but, but we need to be clear because this terminology is often used in a wrong way by many critics of PGTA and is always and it's often I mean, used and reported as an evidence against PGTA, which is not. Um, Self-correction is, is by definition when the, an embryo that starts as, as fully unemployed like a trisomy because the, the, the oocyte was aneuploid, as in the case, then goes through self-correction uh, in the during the pre-implantation development and uh, becomes deployed at the blaster stage. But uh, the self-correction event by itself, so the, the, the generation of a deployed line may bring the fact that some of these self-correction event will result in a uniparental dysonism because of the uh, two chromosomes that were inherited from, from the oocyte, they, they may stay into the corrected cell lines. And we can, we can see it, we can, we can analyze uniparental dysonism in blaster stage human embryos. And there is a very large study at that time from the uh, RMA group that was led by Nathan Treff, and uh, they, they showed that indeed uh, UPD at the blaster stage is very, very rare. That is telling us that, that these self, -self correction events very rarely happen in pre-implantation embryos. So what we know and the mounting evidence is showing is that when, when you have a million kind of load in the embryo, this is fixed throughout development and uh, is of course associated with uh, negative outcomes for the patients in case these embryos are transferred. So the self-correction event is measurable to answer to your question. It has been measured in thousands of human blastocysts and has been shown to be extremely rare. I hope now this is uh, clear. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Antonio. Uh, there is a question that I guess that it's more to a uh, specific lab but I will make to you uh, just to, to check your opinion. Uh, they said the question was, can we select non-mosaic workflow for PGTA analysis? I mean, yeah. I guess the question is more than, uh, you know, that, okay, I don't want to know about anything um, mosaic. Uh, let's make it unemployed. But I, I would like to ask you about what would you recommend? Mm, man, that's a very good question. I mean, uh... 
recent my experience I never reported the mosaic embryos so uh, the answer is 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 quite easy I've been always using this uh, kind of binary way of reporting which is euploid and aneuploid and uh, to be honest I never had the experience so far uh, of mosaic pregnancies as we probably never had uh, in the course of standard IVF. So it's possible uh, to report them just as euploid and aneuploid and, uh, and this is bringing also many advantages I think for the clinics and for patients that do not have to face with uncertain results, with uncertainties, with additional costs for genetic counseling, wasting time, increasing anxiety of patients. I mean I have had many patients um, asking for advice and calling me when they got pregnant following the transfer of what was uh, designated as mosaic embryos and they didn't, I mean, they were not enjoying uh, their pregnancies at all. Uh, so I think before, before introducing all these level of uncertainty and before, uh, I mean, delivering diagnoses of chromosomal abnormalities like mosaicism needs, uh, we really need to have uh, stronger evidence. And uh, yes, it's possible, of course, to, to have a binary approach reporting only euploid and aneuploid embryos, drawing the threshold on, uh, in the middle. Then there are, of course, chromosome specific considerations. We all know well that from, from a technical standpoint, some chromosomes have different amplification profile than others, but in principle, it's possible to apply the same concept the same concept to all chromosomes and drawing the line in the middle and reporting only the euploid and the aneuploid embryos. And I think that this is also the most accurate way to report in PGTA today, uh, based also on um, uh, rebiopsy studies that are uh, indeed showing that this is probably the, the most accurate way of reporting. Thank you very much, Antonio. There is another question regarding trophectoderm biopsy that are asking you which is the best site for taking trophectoderm biopsy. I don't know if you're trying to avoid mosaicism uh, with the biopsy. No, I mean, <clears throat> I think that uh, 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 re reducing or lowering the, the level of mosaicisms can be achieved through uh, the improvement of the biopsy, but not because it's a biological phenomenon, but I think it's really important to, to standardize this is one of the most critical things in, in the, whole, the whole workflow, standardize the biopsy uh, in order to get consistent samples that are of similar cellularity, of similar quality, that have been processed in a similar way. This is really what matters in order to get uh, clear uh, molecular profiles and uh, also to be, to be I mean, able also to, to, to get uh, good, good quality data and uh, good diagnosis from the genetic laboratory. And also to lower all this, this, uh, this level of mosaicism or overcoding of mosaicism, at least the ones that is caused by, by experimental variation. So uh, focusing on, on, the, on the IVF lab, on the biopsy and methodologies that are used and uh, that can be properly applied and standardized, this is, I think, really crucial in, in PGTA. Thank you again, Antonio. So we are almost at the end. And let me ask you about this question that I was mentioning, that you were talking about patient selection bias. So we transfer first the euploid ones, and then at the very end, the mosaic. So obviously, the patients were of poor, prognos poor prognosis at the end, right? So. And also, you, you, you showed us one of the last slides regarding this, right? Eventually, uh, do you think that will be important morphology? I mean, maybe mosaic embryo grade A could be better than a euploid embryo grade C or D. So what do you think? This is some of the questions that we are receiving right now. Yeah, 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 yeah. indeed. This is also a good point, uh, Nasser. I mean, there are no studies comparing, comparing the, you know, the two approaches. While there were recommendations, uh, saying and telling us to, to do that. So to, 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 to transfer your bad quality euploid embryos over, over the, the good quality apparently mosaic embryos. For me, it was kind of shocking to see uh, how recommendations were delivered without any evidence uh, in support. So uh, at present, uh, I think um, if you, you are receiving mosaicism reporting and uh, the mosaicism is in, is in the low 
uh, category a team morphologies be considered together or should be even the main consideration because at the end uh, for the value of mosaics and technical value of mosaics we have evidence we have very robust clinical evidence from decades of application in IVF while for this um, mosaic classification there is very little evidence uh, that is improving any of the outcomes of patients unless we are not talking about high mosaic which is more, more similar to a uniform Yeah, I totally agree that I think that in the these days we will take into account all the different uh, approaches and maybe morphology would be one that it's going to be more interesting for us in order to make the decision to to perform the transfer. So Antonio, uh, prior to, to to say you goodbye, I would like you to to have your one minute gold golden minute, I would say, uh, in order to have a take home message for all the audience that are, are in here uh, waiting for, for your last opinion. Well, <laughs> thanks Nasa. So I think the, the, the final message is, I mean, to be reassured about the, the, the clinical use of embryos that are classified as low or moderate mosaic, uh, because this can be either a technical uh, Artifacts, or it can be the presence of uh, some abnormal cells that are extremely confined to a small portion of the, of the developing embryo that are not affecting the inner cell mass and not affecting also the, the pregnancy. So, I mean, uh, of course, we need to, to keep uh, focusing our attention to uh, expand our research and investigation in this field and get more data, but uh, I think the, the message, the final message, is that we can be uh, reassured and we can uh, consider um, more confidently the transfer of, of, of these embryos and the clinical use of these embryos that otherwise may uh, significantly impact the, the chance of patients to, to get pregnant uh, in the course of the negative treatment cycles, which is really what we do not want, lowering the cumulative life birth rate. Uh, because of uh, PGTA or overcalling that are made in PGTA. So thank you very much again, Antonio, for the wonderful lecture. I will send to your way the questions that we didn't uh, make it, we didn't have to make it. And, and thank you all for being here today again with us. Uh, it's been a pleasure to have you for all of our webinars and uh, we will wait for you on the, on the next one. Thank you very much and have a great day. Thank you, Antonio, and thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you.